Welcome to Bloomberg Markets. I'm Shanali Basik. New jobs report today. The latest economic data pointed out before the election, of course, next week, and of course, before that big Fed decision next week. We're going to cover both this hour. But first, we're going to get a check on these markets because we're bringing you a green day. Finally, uh, in the S&P 500, we have eight tenths of one percent of a move higher. Uh, not on session highs right now, but not too far from them. Nasdaq 100 still up more than one percent on the day, uh, really snapping a week where, of course, you saw October end lower. Finally, November, it's only a day, but starting higher. The two-year yield you're seeing hanging out around 418 on the day. And the 10-year yield, this is where I find the most stunning moves here, actually higher on the day after the data this morning. You're watching it move to about 434, almost got to 435 a little bit earlier. We're going to bring you some midday movers on the equity side, a lot moving under the service. We have Bloomberg Zabby do little for that. There certainly is a lot moving beneath the surface. Chanel, take a look at the shares of Apple down for two days in a row. In fact, down three days in a row, the worst three days since the beginning of August today, down about 1.7 percent. This after they uh, posted basically an inline September quarter. But folks disappointed about the guide for the December quarter. The street had been looking for 7 percent sales growth. It's coming in uh, low to mid single digits on week up iPhone 16 uptake plus China weakness. Let's put this in connection with the Apple chart, the technicals, and see what investors are telling us there. Because right now we are seeing a serious message of selling. This is Apple. This is a weekly chart to show uh, more movement over a shorter period of time, or I should even say less movement to really show what's happening here. So you can see the uptrend. The buyer is very much in control. But this week, breaking that uptrend, the RSI is heading down. Again, this is a weekly chart, so it very much suggests that this drop is only beginning. If we were to put it in terms of the daily move, it would very much look like it might drop down to that 200-day moving average or closer to where it had been earlier this year at 200. The case could even be made that this entire rally, uh, it could disappear. We don't know that, but that is a serious uptrend uh, break telling you, again, the buyers not liking Apple from a fundamental standpoint. What they do like, though, is uh, let's take a look at the shares of Amazon because they are surging today, up 6.7%, 6.8%. There was a nice earnings uh, 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 or excuse me, uh, an earnings miss there, but a nice sales beat. But it's really the cloud growth of 19% that investors like, plus the e-commerce unit doing well. So this stock having a very, very nice day. And then finally, rounding it out outside of uh, earnings, let's take a look at energy. Chevron and, well, Exxon has just turned lower, but Chevron's still hanging on to its gain up 3%. They beat uh, third quarter estimates. City likes the, the EPS beat plus uh, the cash flow. And then Exxon put up a decent quarter, and it had to do with their friend business. Investors turning around on that earlier trading action. We can be looking into that all day, Shanali. Thank you so much, Abigail. And we're going to look more at the U.S. economy now. Bloomberg spoke earlier with BlackRock senior portfolio manager Jeff Rosenberg. He took a measured reaction to today's jobs report. The number is overstated in terms of its weakness because of strikes and hurricanes, and I think everyone knows that. It makes it easier for them to deliver on the 25 cut, which they want, which they, they certainly want to do. Uh, and I think that's an important uh, point to highlight. To talk about what this means for Fed action moving forward, we're joined now by Bloomberg's Michael McKee, also always with a measured approach. If you think about next week and just the uncertainty there is ahead for the Fed, how do you think through not just the near-term moves, but the long-term ones? Well, I think the longer-term moves are up in the air because this report was distorted by the hurricanes and by the Boeing strike. You look at the overall job creation, just 12,000 jobs created, 223,000 the month before that's revised down a little bit but manufacturing payrolls were off by 46,000 and we saw that there were 44,000 people on strike uh, at both Boeing and Textron the unemployment rate though unchanged 4.1 percent maybe average hourly earnings a little off because of the people who lost their jobs the the jobs they lost are probably mostly lower paid service industry jobs so it's hard for the Fed to get a good read on this the BLS said they can't quantify the effects of the hurricanes, but they were obviously very large. I mean, you know, if you talk to PIMCO, if you talk to TD Bank, for example, both of them have said today, uh, Gennady and, and Tiffany Wilding over there, have said if you rounded, it looks a little scarier. 
the unemployment report. What do you make of that? Well, yeah, you can always play that game. Uh, <laughs> basically, it, it came out at 4.114. So if we got uh, if we gotten a, a 115, it would have rounded up to two. Uh, to, to 4.2 and so yes you can you can play that game but uh, it's such a small change that it doesn't really mean anything because the Fed is looking at 4.3 or higher for something that they would worry about or something that they would get them to consider changing their uh, minds about uh, next week so at this point this report doesn't suggest any reason to do anything but 25 basis points. What are you going to be watching for, whether it's the election or whether it's what's happening at the Fed on Thursday next week? Well, all that. Unfortunately, they're not happening on the same day, so we don't have to worry about it. But there's a good well, question. We don't know there's, what we a, there's a big question <laughs> about whether we'll get the Fed decision before we get a presidential decision. So that could weigh on people. The Fed has to look through the election, though. They can't make any policy based on it because they're not going to know a who won and a, even if they knew who won what are their policies are going to get through the congress so at this point they just sit back and watch and base uh, their decisions on what the economy is doing and at this point it does look like the economy is still in very good shape we'll keep an eye on the moves of which there will be many michael mckee thank you so much for keeping your eye on all the data that matters for more on that data we're now joined by blarina yurucci she's chief economist at t row price and you know we were talking to mike a little earlier i don't know if you had heard what he was saying about the rounding here of the uh the unemployment report he says you could play that game but it still keeps you far away from the fed where the fed would be concerned uh do you have any concerns from where we had uh, data coming Coming out today, particularly when there was so much uncertainty behind that data. Exactly. I would echo this idea that it's hard. The information content in this report is not very large, even if you factor in the downward revisions to the prior months, because what happened with weather effects and the strike effect has affected the seasonal factors. And so it's not giving us a very clear picture of the fundamental strength of the U.S. labor market. And then you add to that the very low um, response rates in this report, I think it's hard to then say, okay, let's unround the unemployment rate to three decimals and then the picture looks that much worse. So I would really focus on the fact that we didn't learn a lot from this payroll report, apart from the fact that the strikes and the hurricanes are affecting U.S. labor market data in October. How do you think about the overlay of the U.S. election here? That is something that is very directly already impacting markets in real time. And it's pretty impressive to see the 10-year float towards 435 on a day where you saw essentially a lot weaker data than people had expected. You saw that two-year yield move lower and that 10-year just take off. So with this election, what we're really focusing on is the fact that it is a close election, no matter how you uh, look at it. And whenever we have elections that are this close and we're even debating whether we will know who the president of this country is going to be by the end of the week, next week, then I think that leads to increased uncertainty and increased volatility. So that's how we're analyzing uh, the election risks. And we do think it has the uh, potential to slow down growth. But then once that uncertainty is cleared and uh, it's an orderly clearing of that uncertainty, that activity should come back. Uh, labor market strength should continue. We see the U.S. economy as fundamentally quite resilient. There is a lot here to extend the business cycle. And so election is a period of uncertainty. Uh, with the resolution of that uncertainty, we should see employment growth improve uh, in the, by the end of the year. And where does that leave the Fed? They have to do monetary policy under uncertainty. But I think for the next couple of meetings, they stay the course because even once we know the the winner of the uh, presidential vote, we need to wait for how they're going to govern versus how they campaigned. And so the Fed being a more cautious policymaker, I don't think will 
uh, set monetary policy in anticipation of what those candidates might uh, announce, but rather wait until Q1 of next year. So when I'm thinking about monetary policy for this year, I think uh, it's set in course that the Fed has enough information there to cut interest rates by 25 basis points at the November and December meeting. This that we received today, I don't think it has fundamental weakness to drive the Fed to deliver a larger cut to the extent that they were trying to play catch up and were behind the mm -hmm. curve in terms of easing monetary right. policy. They achieved that with a Lorena. larger interest rate cut at the September meeting. Lorena, you know, the other thing I'm very curious about is the fiscal component of this. There are many investors out there who see a lot of the strength behind the U.S. consumer really attributed to how much money has been put into the economy by the U.S. government itself. Of course, that money would take borrowing to continue to achieve. And when you see uh, borrowing costs potentially on the brink of rising, that becomes a question. So how big of a role is stimulus playing in the strength of the economy at the moment? I think there is enough support there, but this support from fiscal in terms of credit tax credit in terms of support to the consumer has been a known known for the markets for some time. Uh, as we look forward, I think what stands out to me is how high the deficit is as a percent of GDP. Uh, at about 6-7%, we don't see these types of deficits outside of recession. So you could argue that fiscal remains supportive of the consumer and the U.S. economy, but not to expect another positive impulse on top of what, what is already priced in the market. And then whoever becomes president, I think at some point we need to discuss what do we do about this level of deficit because it's not sustainable over the medium to long run. And so I think the market is going to snip that out and it will want the large deficits to be addressed. And if it's not addressed, the way it's going to show up in uh, U.S. Treasury yields is to increase term mm -hmm. premium, especially for the long end. Right. As an investor, with this amount of fiscal stimulus, you will demand a higher inflation premium and a higher fiscal premium to hold treasuries. Mm -hmm. Lorena, we thank you so very much for your time. That is Lorena Yerucci. She is T. Rowe Price's chief economist, of course, on a day with a lot of messy economic data. So thank you so very much for parsing that for us. Now coming up, Apple shares falling after the company issued a cautious outlook and Intel investors seeing a new wave of optimism after earnings. We're going to dig into those next. This is Bloomberg. The upper executives in a company don't exactly own it. It's all the little shareholders like you and I and and others and investors and so and so they're watching every little report and everything and turn it, the stock up and down. Apple is a little bit and I do recognize the problem of iPhone being kind of the major product. We are sort of closer to a one product company. That was Apple co-founder Steve Wozniak talking to Bloomberg's The Close in an exclusive interview yesterday after earnings. And as we turn to the stock of the hour, we're watching how investors are reacting to that earnings report and Apple's outlook. For more on this, we're joined by Bloomberg technology anchor Ed Ludlow, who is the only person I really want to hear from today, honestly. And it has been a long week of magnificent, magnificent seven earnings. And let's talk about Apple first here for a moment because, of course, it's kind of where you're seeing a little sour tone in the market. There's a lot of things to know about what you can tell about their intelligence features moving forward. How do you soak all of it in? Yeah, it just wasn't a clean cut print, right? You know, there was strength in the quarter gone. Apple basically grew in every geography around the world apart from in greater China. And as we know, going into it, you know, there's a great focus on Apple's performance in uh, China, because in terms of consumer electronics as an end market, it's so critical. iPhone grew, but we don't really know definitively if it did grow in China. And then you go straight to the outlook, as you will do with any technology earnings, which is that Apple will continue to grow in the low single digits in the final three months of this year. So the question that's still being posed is future growth. Where's that coming from, particularly in the context of its services business missing the mark a bit in the print that we got last night? 
it's the worst performer in that Magnificent Seven. The best performer today, of course, is Amazon. And so yeah. up almost 7%, up more than 6.5% at the moment. Um, what is the optimism here, and what does it say about its prospects moving into next year? Yeah, so Amazon is the leader in cloud computing, right? AWS, its cloud unit, posted 19% top-line growth. And so that was a number that the market was kind of relieved and happy about. Um, and they gave us a forecast for the final three months of this year, both in terms of revenue and operating income, that showed a solid holiday quarter. The e-commerce part of the, build, uh, of the business is still important, even if cloud computing and everything that's happening with AI is the cash cow or cash generating focus. And so, you know, we know what the story has been all earnings season long. CapEx numbers are very large. But if you show evidence that you're starting to make money from it, and they gave a lot of fighting talk about AI customers for cloud computing, um, you're rewarded. And that seems to be consistent in Amazon's case. I also want to talk a little bit more about Intel here as well. Having a very good day, the best since the middle of September. You know, what do we know about their turnaround story here? It's interesting to see that kind of reaction in the stock when there's also been so much event-driven news around it. It's an interesting, probably relief-driven rally in the stock. The third quarter print was ugly because Intel took impairment charges related to headcount reduction and all the, the projects it's cancelled as it fights to kind of regain leadership in the, in the categories of semiconductor where historically it's been strong. They gave guidance for the fourth quarter, the last three months of this year, that basically was enough to show the market they might be turning a corner. One negative, though, is that all we care about is these AI chips, right? GPUs, AI accelerators, where NVIDIA is 99% of the market, AMD's got some, and then Intel told us that they missed the mark. They're not going to hit their sales target, which was already modest, $500 million for Gaudi. And Pat Gelsinger gave me two explanations. One, they have a later generation of that chip coming, so customers are waiting for it. But contrary to that, he also said the software isn't really keeping up. So there's still a bit of a mess to unpick on how they're doing. And uh, for now, investors are back in Gelsinger. Ed, we thank you so much. It was a great interview. I suggest everyone look for it online. Might be some good weekend viewing. That is Ed Ludlow of Bloomberg Technology. And coming up, as we've been talking about, markets are bracing for the U.S. election outcome, and you can see those trades all over the place. Our next guest, Christian Deary, shares his strategy from an investor's point of view. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets, and I'm Shanali Basik. We are days away from the polls closing in the U.S. elections, and investors are going to be waiting those results. The economy is perhaps the biggest issue among voters. Consumer confidence has been wavering, but earnings expectations continue to rise. For more on this, we are joined by Christian Deary. He's the head of macro strategy at Capital Fund Management. He joins us live from London to discuss how investors are navigating all the dynamics, because, Christian, there is a very interesting trade underpinning this market. There are a lot of Trump trades underpinning this market, for example, in the 10-year, to see it hit, for example, uh, 435 just today. I'm wondering how you think these trades are going to play out heading into and out of Tuesday. Yeah, thank you for ha having me uh, on the show. Yeah, so really there's two forces at work here. Uh, outside of the election, it's just been the strong U.S. data, which happens to have the same sign as the Republican sweep trade. And we've seen the odds increase of a Republican sweep. So the, the price action has been very similar to 2016 when Trump won uh, with a sweep. So we, you know, we see bonds selling off, the dollar rallying. We see the yield curve uh, steepening. Then we see certain sectors outperforming. So, for example, if you look at financials for the month of October, they've done very well. So in the sense of discounting the chance, chances of a Republican win, uh, the, the market is essentially reacting to that and pricing it. So what happens if you don't see Trump win the election? What unwinds and how drastically does it unwind if Kamala Harris does win? Well, there, yeah, I think you really have to focus on the outcome. So uh, without a Democratic sweep, which is very unlikely, uh, and part of the reason for that is just the Senate math, it's going to be very hard for the Democrats to uh, hold the Senate because of the staggered voting. 
and there's only 12 seats that are actually in play. So they have to win nine of those, then win the presidency, uh, and use the vice president to, uh, to uh, cast the tie-breaking vote in the Senate. Um, so most likely we get a split outcome uh, in, in Congress. And that's really more of the same. So fiscal continues. Uh, and, you know, austerity is a forbidden word for both parties. You're not allowed to mention it. So just baseline under the Democratic platform, you, we have a fiscal deficit running at around 6%. Uh, and, you know, under the Republicans, you know, say they swept, you're looking at fiscal deficits on the order of 8 to 8 to 10%. That's obviously very stimulative in the short run and is part of the appeal for politicians. Well, so what uh, is... So we'll move mm -hmm. What is a surefire oh, trade either way? Is there anything that looks underpriced to you in the market that might just perform well no matter what? Yeah, I, I think for the, the medium term, it's, it's really the, the big macro issue this cycle is the, the fiscal backdrop, right? Uh, we've, it's really an unprecedented level spending. So that, that has implications and it's inflationary. So, you know, the, you know, the front end of the curve is pricing too many cuts. Uh, bonds will sell off. I, those, those investments still have lots of potential to them. Is there and a sector? really the, the fiscal underpinning, underpinning is important. Is there a sector you like best? Uh, well, that will depend on the outcome. So, so one way to, uh, you know, we're a systematic manager, so we run a very diversified business. Uh, but for discretionary traders, you know, one approach is just to wait for the outcome. So for example, if you get a red sweep, it's, you know, the, the basket of investments that you're gonna hold is quite obvious, very similar to 2016, and you can just wait. Because this isn't like a payroll where you get a reaction and it fades in five minutes. These trades will extend for long periods mm -hmm. of time. But it's, again, the mm -hmm. fiscal backdrop is really a key driver here, particularly right. for fixed income markets in, in the dollar. Christian, we have to leave it there. I wish we had more time. But of course, the most sound of advice, just wait. <laughs> of course, uh, there's a few days to be waiting. That is Christian Deary of CFM. Now, I'm Shanali Basic. That does it for Bloomberg Markets on the day. Finally ending the week with some green, but a busy week ahead of us. Get some rest. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg.